Well, good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Uh, may I remind all those in the public gallery to turn their devices to silent if they aren't already. And um, may I uh, indicate, first of all, we have apologies from committee member Gordon MacDonald and also from committee member Colin Beattie. And may I welcome Daniel Johnson as a new member of the committee and invite him at this stage to make any declaration of relevant interest that he may have. Well, firstly, convener, thank you for your welcome. Um, and in terms of my interest, I would refer members to uh, my register. And in particular, I'm a director of a company which has retail interests in the city centre of Edinburgh. Thank you. Now, this, uh, item, agenda item two is a decision by the committee to take items five, six and seven in private. Um, the committee is also asked to decide whether consideration of a draft report on economic data and consideration of a draft report on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018 to 19 should be taken in private at future meetings. Is the committee agreed with that? Yes. Thank you. Now, this morning we move to now to our evidence session in which we're looking at draft budget scrutiny of the budget 2018-19 and Scotland's economic performance. Uh, we had uh, had two witnesses down to appear before the committee today, but in the event it is uh, one witness, Linda Scott, who is Chief Executive Officer at West Lothian Chamber of Commerce. So welcome to you, Linda Scott. Um, thank you very much for coming in today. And uh, in light of the change in witnesses, we'll simply be doing this as a single session covering uh, a number of issues that uh, are relevant to your area of operations, your remit. So I would like to move to that session now. Um, the sound desk will control the mic uh, for everyone. And if anyone wishes to come in as a committee member, please simply indicate by raising their hand. <coughs> So I would like to start, first of all, with a question from committee member Alec Neal. Hey, thank you very much indeed, convener. Good morning. Um, I, there are two broad areas I would like to explore. One is the specific issue of account management and the effectiveness of account management by Scottish enterprise of companies. And then once we explore that, look at where tomorrow's jobs and industry are going to come from at both a kind of local level as well as that, how that feeds into the national uh, strategies at Scottish and UK level. So in terms of account management, and I should declare an interest in that many years ago, long before I came in here, I was an economic consultant and involved in the design of account management systems, both for Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and um, I, I, we are now um, in well into the 21st century. So my first question, Linda, is are account management programmes by Scottish Enterprise effective? Are they adding value? Um, can we clearly identify new jobs and in industry that would not have happened without the account management system? Okay. Um, firstly, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, to gather a little bit of information, before I came here, I did um, put out a bit of a sort of survey and questionnaire to several um, companies in our area, small and large. So the information that came back was, was varied. Um, in, in general, the larger companies came back and said that account management was really, really uh, good for business uh, and proactive and they felt that there had been a big improvement in that service say in the last five years uh, one very large multinational in particular they said now they're more sector specific and the, the the managers are for a specific area it's working a lot better so i would say the larger companies are already quite uh, secure companies find the service very, very useful, and very productive, and uh, very good for you know, investing in the future. The small SME type, type market, the middle sort of bracket market, on the other hand, find it much harder work to work with account management. It's difficult to qualify. They find it quite cumbersome, a little bit, um, I would say, outdated and old fashioned kind of process. These newer companies that are coming in need to work at a much faster, slicker process. I'd heard from one CEO that runs a large company actually that had said that the way um, companies work these days, the newer companies, the millennial type companies, are looking at a 100 day turnaround. And a lot of the process at the moment with account management is quite a long, slow process. So uh, what, what would they like instead of the account, current account management system? 
how, well, how can they be best helped? Best helped? Um, the, 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 the general basis of this is that the, the, the service is needed and required. There's maybe a, a bit of an add-on beforehand, a more business-to-business -business approach would be an asset, something that's not quite so tied in with the red tape of the agencies uh, that would help in a faster getting them ready to get to get to be account managed. Some a lot of companies need to be got ready to be get account managed. So there seems to be a, a, a bit before that account managed needs to step in. I'm certainly dealing with a, a fairly large company, still technically an SME in my own constituency, and uh, they've recently applied, well, last year they applied for regional selective assistance, and, and they were an account-managed company, and it's taken them eight months to get a response uh, on their application. And they just think, you know, in this day and age, that should be dealt with far, far quicker than that. E even if the answer is no, at least tell us up front the answer is no. But why, in you know, a system that's been running for many years, RSA, why does it take eight months to get a response? That, that's the type of feedback that we're getting from companies of, of all sizes, is the length of time for decision. We had an engineering company that was looking for support to buy new machinery, and that's exactly it. They had to walk away eventually because it took too long to even, as you say, get an initial response, whether it going to be a yes or no, which was a yes, but by which point they'd had to go ahead and buy the machinery because well, it, it took too, too long yeah. to, get, um, <coughs> to get a response. So speed, really, much more speed. Yeah. In, in decisions and slicker processes, more up to date with the 21st century processes. Right. So RSA is an area that really needs investigated because I mean I, I personally think we are losing jobs and investment in Scotland because the RSA process is so bureaucratic, so time consuming, and so nebulous at times actually. Um, and obviously that's your experience as well. Our experience as well. Yes. You know, it's maybe From, a, it's something for the committee to pursue further, convener. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as I say, the larger companies aren't finding it so, but they've probably got the time, they've got the resources yes. in-house to take time to look at it. But that's the sort of general general feeling that we've been getting from the companies that we speak to. So with the larger companies, I mean, one, one of the advantages originally of the account management system was intended to be a lot of these multinational companies. Um, the Scottish management, or sometimes the UK management, um, are fighting against... Um, their colleagues in other countries to secure new investment, yes. new plant. Um, and if they have the account management system, it can ensure that the support of Scottish enterprise and if required, the Scottish government, hopefully can you know become much more heavily involved to entice the company to favour Scotland in terms of locational decisions. Um, is that the kind of advantage the larger companies see or what, yes. what are the, the advantages they see in the account management system? Yes, that is one of the large companies I spoke to. That's exactly something they see as an asset because it is a, mu a large multinational company and they do actually compete in-house to a degree to go after specific bids. So any sort of support on that front does help them winning contracts. And the other thing is, from the government's point of view and Scottish Enterprise's point of view, if there is a potential threat to the existing investment and jobs, then the account manager should be the early warning system to try and preempt that as mm -hmm. much as we you, you possibly can. Sometimes yep. you can, um, and, and is that working is it from from a big company point of view? I, I would say that is working. Yes, in the right. area there has been also areas where it's maybe been missed. You know, where companies that have maybe gone into liquidation in our area, you felt that should have been signs should have been spotted sooner. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, down uh, to the quality of the account manager. The quality of the account manager is very important. Yeah. yeah. But basically, the, the, the main issue to be addressed is the lack of sufficient support for SMEs yep. and the bureaucracy around things like RSA. Exactly. It won't just be RSA, there'll be R&D grants and stuff yeah. as well that are problematic. And as you touched on there, again, it's, it's come from members in our area, the quality of the agent is very important as well. Yeah. There's certain sectors, they have, they have the experts, some sectors not quite such, the expertise is not quite as good, and then that, that's where it falls down. Is it a service that large companies would pay something for? Or do they expect it to be free? They, they might expect it to be free. That would be a question you need to ask then. But, right. um, I, I do feel that um, 
I also head up the developing young workforce in our area for West Lothian, so we do a lot of work with the big companies in our <coughs> area now, and I would say that the, the interest in, in being more involved themselves and, and investing in what they're doing has changed drastically in the last sort of year yeah. and a half to two years because it's sort of a, a, a change in their, their sort of thinking that the way they need to get involved, yeah. and that is something that I think could filter through to many other aspects of their work. It's just that there's evidence from past programmes that shows if a company has to make a contribution to the cost of providing advice and consultancy support and the like, they're much more likely to value that uh, and to make more demands on it, but get greater results. Yes, exactly. Whereas um, if they get it free, it's neither here nor there. I think it varies. It depends on the project and what, what they're being asked to do. You know, yeah. If it's an investment to improve on... and productivity, yeah. then I'd say in certain areas they would, they would invest, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I move to the broader question, because it seems to me that the fundamental challenge facing us all, given the forecasts from the likes of the Bank of England and the US Fed and so on, about the very high percentage of jobs that are going to disappear over the next 20 years or so um, because of artificial intelligence and robotics, is the answer to the question, where are tomorrow's jobs going to come from? Okay. So can I ask, uh, and I realise obviously we're talking about West Lothian here, yeah. but I think this is an issue that needs to be addressed at local as well as national uh, level. So is there any work being done either by the Chamber or by local businesses or by the local authority or other bodies at a West Lothian level, either to try to answer that question at a local level or input to the national conversation at Scottish or UK level. I mean, obviously, we, did, we had the industrial strategy from the UK government published yesterday, um, and it's broadly along the same lines as the Scottish government's strategy. They're not in any way, I, as far as I can see, contradictory. Um, but I just wonder how much that permeates, uh, that thinking permeates down to local level. Um, good, good question. It is something that has started to be talked about, we, we, but it, it's still... I, I'm not aware of anything in particular that's been done or any processes in place to, to look into it in the future, but it is something that I've, I've noticed has been talked about more even in the last six months than it's ever been talked about, but I'm, I'm not aware of anything in particular that's going on. So would it be worthwhile, for example, <coughs> at a, a local level, um, you know, given the Bank of England forecasts and others, Looking at, I mean, West Lothian, in relative terms, is a fairly advanced local economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the interaction with Edinburgh is important as well. But yes. is it worthwhile at a local level trying to identify the jobs that are likely to be lost and how many jobs will need to be replaced over the next 10 to 15 years, in as much as any forecasting can be accurate? But guess, get, just get a sense of magnitude. Um, I certainly think it would. Uh, actually, just thinking there in hindsight, it is actually something we've talked about our Developing Young Workforce Board. Right. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, particularly on the back of the city deal, actually looking at what the jobs of the future are going to be in our area over the next 10 years, and then our focus being on that to work with schools and colleges for our young people coming through. So it is something we've been touched on. So at our Developing Young Workforce level, it's something that potentially could be looked at into more, more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you. I think Daniel Johnson had a, a short follow-up on that. I, I'm just interested in, what, in terms of what you're saying in terms of the, 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 the difference of experience between large companies and SMEs. I mean, I think one of the key challenges in the economy is about growing, you know, turning the S's into M's and then yes. onwards. Do, do you think that, do you accept that premise? And, and, and what things would you like to see Scottish Enterprise do differently if they were to, to be more focused on, on that challenge? What would I like to see them do? I, I, I certainly, from the feedback I've been getting from businesses, is that they feel that the, the, the smaller SME market is feel that they, they are being neglected and you have to be a big company to, to qualify and, and get assets. So I think looking at them in the first place would be a, would be a good step. Uh, but I think the processes that are in place just now would be too time consuming and cumbersome for them. Um, to, to be involved. Um, I mean, I did have a conversation with somebody from government just a few months ago, is that there is that, that gap even between Business Gateway and Scottish Enterprise at the moment, uh, and it's all very well to go into somewhere and say, right, you need to write a business plan. You know, probably eight out of 10 wouldn't know how to write a business plan or really have a requirement for a business plan. Um, 
I was at a conference in London last week and this was talked about from very large companies. There was a company, I won't mention the name, it turns over £40 million. They don't have a business plan, but it's a, it's a millennial type business that's worth going at a very, very fast rate. It, it doesn't require the same sort of set up sort of old, as we've gone back to the old fashioned sort of way of setting up a business. So there is that gap, what it is, what it exactly looks like. I wouldn't be able to, to tell you here today. Um, I would like to look into it and see what it is, but uh, there is definitely something missing, a gap there for the smaller markets and the fast moving markets of today. And Andy Whiteman. Mr. Mr. <clears throat> Just following up from that, what, what regular feedback do you get from your members about the services they receive from Scottish Enterprise or, in fact, Business Gateway? Is that something you're routinely seeking? It's something that we routinely do, but I have to say, when I put out this um, email to our members asking them for feedback for today, I was really impressed and surprised with the feedback that I got. As I said, it was very varied, quite 50-50, I would say, actually, good good and bad. Uh, and I, we actually said as a board that we would start doing this on a regular basis um, to, to get feedback. And I think, um, again, I head up in our area the international bid where we work uh, on that side of things and since we've got that bid money and working in closer partnership with the likes of SDI has made a big big difference to uh, the awareness of their presence in our area um, so I would say something like this we would like to follow through in the same type of and, and I mean are you aware that Scottish Enterprise do any surveys of the kind of businesses that are members of yours they no, they don't they don't do anything through us no they don't do anything through you direct, no, directly no. through you um, I mean what confidence do you have in Scottish Enterprises' intelligence about what's going on at the uh, at the cool face, as it were, amongst ordinary businesses operating in the country? At the ordinary businesses, I think their focus in our area is of the large multinational companies and not so much the, the as I'm saying, the smaller SME market. I wouldn't. Um, I would like to see them more engaged with uh, the chambers, so come you know, along to see what we're doing, meet our members. I would say probably the majority of our members would not have had any contact with them. Because that, that leads me on to the, um, I think it was the Heseltown Review in, um, a few years ago suggested that in comparison with other countries, businesses are not that well integrated into mainstream kind of policy making ongoing issues. No one's suggesting they have any executive authority or anything like that, but the kind of model whereby they are consulted or not irregularly and feel somewhat at a distance from the machinery of government, whether central or local, was something that he picked up. Is, is that something you, you recognise? Yes, I definitely recognise that. And I think there'd be a huge appetite for business in our area to be more involved whenever we've had the opportunity to to, to host something like that or when the committee came to our area I mean it, it wasn't difficult to find businesses to be engaged in that uh, and I know in the future we, we would we would fill a room if they were to get regular access to, to speak to people within government and agencies and in general terms what's 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 uh, the business environment been like in West Lothian over the last 10 years uh, varied again <laughs> we've had some good stories and some really really bad stories um, in, in general, we only hear about the, the bad, the bad news, the big, the big closures. But as as, as one big company closes, there's several new ones opens. West Lothian is definitely one of the fastest growing areas in Scotland at the moment, and and uh, I know on a, a personal view, we had a lot of empty buildings for many years, and I know several of them that are full now. It's not easy to find premises in West Lothian Livingston now, and especially not on the warehouse side of things. I know at one point we had trouble with a couple of companies looking for expansion to find more space. So there, there, is, there is growth within the area and activity, um, and all sorts. We have a very, very varied area. I think if you name a business, you'll find it in West Lothian somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in terms of the broader economic climate, um, in terms of employment and interest rates and productivity and all the rest of it, what's the experience of your members? This is, um, unemployment is very low, so actually recruiting is very difficult. A lot of companies are growing at a very fast pace and they struggle to recruit. So recruitment it would be our biggest issue in our area um, because there's just not the workforce there to fill the jobs. Why is that? Well, it, A, the volume of the companies. There's a lot of manufacturing companies there with large volume uh, staff there, plus we lose 
uh, we can lose talent to the likes of Edinburgh and Glasgow, so it's keeping them in-house. Uh, we have a lot of uh, large companies with their headquarters in West Lothian, so we need some of the best talent there to stay, but they're, they're still leaving and going to Glasgow and Edinburgh. But again, just the sheer volume of the workforce required in the area. Okay, I'll come back to a few points later. Thanks. Um, Tom Arthur. Good morning. Good morning. I'm interested to hear um, your point, Ms Scott, regarding losing talent to Glasgow and Edinburgh. I'm an MSP for covering Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire, so having Glasgow right on our doorstep is a huge magnet, but it also presents opportunities, and I certainly know in the United States and big cities of um, surrounding areas, the pillars have capitalised upon these cities. What particular opportunities and challenges do you think are presented for, something, uh, for, for example, for West Lothian, with the proximity to both Edinburgh and indeed Glasgow? And do you think there is enough tailored support that takes cognizance of these challenges? Um, could you ask that question again and sort of break it down into a bit? Sorry. It, it's simply because you have a, a very unique set of challenges. Often when we think about a unique set of challenges for businesses in Scotland, we may think of rural areas, for example, or the Highlands and Islands. But for yourself, you have a proximity of Edinburgh and Glasgow and it's in, you know, struggling to recruit people, losing talent to these big cities. Do you feel there's enough tailored support available from agencies such as Scottish Enterprise to enable you to retain talent and to support businesses in that particular environment? I would say um, the support to retain talent and, and focus on it more has, is improving, uh, particularly over the last couple of years. And again, I know I keep harping back on it, but I see it as a huge success is developing your workforce. Um, the targets and have, have gone through the roof with that and just raising awareness of the actual companies within the area. Again, one of our largest companies in the area, they have every job from cleaners to accountants to sales, but they have from the outside, people have a perception of what they are and who they do. So just general raising awareness of the actual jobs that they have in there has made a huge difference um, to actually, it needs to be something that's done within school and and, and bringing our future workforce through. When they're not aware of what's there, they just they just don't know what's involved. Uh, so their thought process is, you know, if I need to work for a good law firm, I need to go to Edinburgh because is there even one in West Lothian? So just a lot more uh, awareness. So I'd say the developing young workforce has done that, but that could be expanded in, into more. Um, as I've spoken to DWP, the, the developing your workforce is working so well, there's now gaps now with your middle market and your ageing workforce that we need to focus on them and raise awareness within those groups. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. And come on now to Gillian Martin. Thank you, Vener, and uh, welcome to the committee, Linda. I, I have to say I very much enjoyed our visit with you uh, a couple of months ago. Um, we know that internationalisation is a challenge for Scottish businesses. Um, I want to um, ask you about the local export partnerships. I believe that West Lothian are involved with that. Could you give me a, an overview of, of, of what that is and how that's working so far? I know it's very early stages. Um, yes, yeah, that's very early stages, but we have been working on something similar uh, over the last sort of, well, most of this year, to be honest. And I see it as, as awareness raising, if you like. We did some research uh, at the beginning of this year and we really struggled to get companies to respond, even to tell us if they were exporting or where they're exporting to. So the outcome we had to get from that research was that the appetite is just not there at the moment. I think around us of all the uncertainty and things that are going on. So I would say the, the, the idea of the local enterprise partnership is to raise awareness and work more collaboratively together to help support and encourage companies into the world of export. So is, there, is the idea to have partnership working with companies who are already exporting to actually share that information and that knowledge about how to tap into the um, overseas markets? Um, our initial thought process would be to try to encourage the businesses that hadn't thought about exporting, but since we have um, started holding events and raising awareness and we in West Lowland have, have uh, launched our international club, um, it's both. It's, it's companies that have never exported before and companies are exporting and are looking to move into new markets. So there's even companies that are coming to us to, for support and advice that are, are exporting in five or six countries. They're not, they're not first timers, if you like, but they know that, um, that the chamber process just now is more our sort of B2B connections uh, with all the other chambers across the network and then different chambers across the world. It's been quite well publicised, so we've had a lot of interest asking if we can help get into certain countries. 
One one of the things I want I want to ask you about, and forgive me if you, if you can't answer this, and uh, I know I'm going to be coming from left field, but I was at a university uh, last night up in my area in Aberdeen, Robert Gordon University, and they were saying that um, they have got links throughout the, the world. And um, I, I was asking them about how they're working with uh, businesses in order to, to maximise business input to those links. And there's an opportunity there to be working with, with education who've got links all over the world. Uh, is West Lothian doing any of that kind of work with, with education providers? Uh, yes, it's just starting. We haven't in the past, to be honest. I mean, we've got a very strong partnership with West Lothian College. Um, they wouldn't probably be too directly involved in export, but one of our local universities has actually approached us on that side of things. And we, I was over in Ireland last month and we've signed an MOU with um, South Dublin Chamber to work on encouraging companies to export to Ireland. And I was approached from one of their large colleges there, again, to look at sort of partnership working. Um, um, so since they're aware of what we are doing, they are starting to actually to come and approach us. So I would say with the, by next summer, there would be a few formal relationships set up. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really encouraging to yeah. hear. Um, do you think that, uh, just asking you about internationalisation in general, um, do you think there's more scope for the government or SDI to do more to help chambers in this regard and, and by you know, local businesses as a, re as a result of that? Um, I certainly do, yes. Uh, I have to say, you know, moving in the world of internationalisation, West Lothian is, is new to us and um, I'm even pleasantly surprised myself of the interest that we have got since saying that we are being involved in this market. I mean, I see uh, wholeheartedly there is a place for SDI and SC in this. I mean, they are the experts, but it's still we have a place and bringing them to the table to then signpost them to the right partners and support. And I also think even when they are working with SDI and SC, sometimes they need external support to help them through that process. And I feel that that's where the chambers can come in. Um, and I also feel the companies that are approaching me specifically for Ireland, as I say, they're not... Um, new exporters, but they're very keen to be supported by the Chamber because they know they've got actually B2B links on the ground rather than just another agency. B2B links are so essential for them and I think that's where the Chamber network comes in. Mm. So if effectively, just off the back of Alec Neil's question, and there seems to be, again, a little bit of a gap in the SMEs where you know business startups are catered for very high-end, uh, large businesses are catered for in terms of internationalisation at that end, yeah. but the SMEs that make up the, the bulk of the Scottish economy are maybe um, needing to be tapped into a lot, a lot more in terms of internationalisation. They need to be tapped into, and business likes to do business with business. They understand the, 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 the phrases, the chat, the, the, what goes on behind closed doors in a business. These types of companies need that type of support. And the type of support they get from SDI and SE can be off-putting to them at the start. Um, as I said, I think their support is essential, but they might need that business-to-business -business support to get them into that process in the first place. And I think that's where the gap is. OK. I know some of my colleagues want to follow up on this. Yeah, um, Daniel Johnson. Yeah, so... Uh, I uh, would like to ask you a question about, about business gateway, and it actually relates to kind of your, your answer you gave to, to my previous supplementary. I mean, obviously, one of the key things that happened in 2007 was business gateway got separated from Scottish <laughs> Enterprise. I mean, how well does business gateway work in and of itself for your members, and 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 really, how could and how does does its links with Scottish Enterprise work, and are, are they effective? Um. Business Gateway, again, it has its good points and its, it's not so good points. Again, it comes down to the agent and the, the person that you go to see. Uh, I think we need a lot more experts in Business Gateway. Um, again, you want to sit in front of somebody who's had a business and talk to you. I find the agents that we speak to a lot of times are not experienced in the world of business, and that can be a downfall and put people off. Uh, again, a little bit too much bureaucracy goes on. Um, the, my own experience is that they are quite quick to pass you to Scottish Enterprise, which is good, but I think the service you get is, is, is of a better quality once you get to Scottish Enterprise. In, in my personal experience of Business Gateway was that they were very geared up for people starting a business. If you were already in business, they really didn't have very much to say to you. It, it, would you think that's a sort of a fair kind of thing to say about them? Of my own personal opinion, I would agree, yes. Um, uh, 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 so I, I guess, kind of, the, from from your perspective, um, what what 
what things do you think could and should be done to kind of improve that kind of seamless experience between Business Gateway and Scottish Enterprise? Is there anything that you could identify in particular? I don't think I'd identify anything in particular. Again, from my own experience with dealing Business Gateway, you want to get on the pipeline to Scottish Enterprise as fast as possible because there is more support there, more support that's of actually a real value to you if you're setting up a business. Uh, most companies, large or small, are initially looking for funding, be it funding as simple as helping you write your business plan, going back to writing business plan. Um, it's, it's costly to even take time to set up a business and everybody says they, they initially go to Business Gateway looking for some kind of support and they're just not getting that when they go to Business Gateway, so the faster they can get on the pipeline, the better. Um, so there needs, to be, uh, there needs to be more closer working and the same sort of ad, you know, the, the Scottish Investment Bank, I think, is an amazing... Uh, asset, but companies are not using it, are not aware of it, they're not even getting that far down the line because they're going to Business Gateway first when really something like that set up would be the best first point of call. I mean, to what extent do you think that there needs to be a kind of more work done to actually explain to businesses what's available? I mean, certainly, again, from my personal experience, it all seemed like a, a bit of a black box. The Business Gateway stuff wasn't relevant, and then frankly, trying to penetrate and understand what was available from Sketch Enterprise was, was very difficult. I mean, do you think that there's an issue there? There's is a definite issue there. I have been at meetings with people from Business Gateway and I've told them what they've got available. So, yes, there's a definite issue there. Um, so I'd also like just to move on to, to the, the area of, of uh, productivity. And, and again, some of the, the evidence that the committee's heard previously is that, the, 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 um, that there's a lot of focus at the high end in terms of kind of the, the, the big picture macro policy but but not so much in terms of the, the sort of the, the kind of the detailed work at the low end. I mean from your perspective, I mean what what how would you understand the productivity challenge and, and what what kind of steps from a, in a practical sense do you think you know businesses in your area you know could use and could welcome in terms of improving their productivity? Um that's, that's, a big, that's a big question. <laughs> How do you change the world? <laughs> um, I, again, I, I just keep harping back to this because I think it's the biggest uh, success story we've had in years, actually, as a developing young workforce. I think something that the chambers would be able to have time to sit down and come up with something in it that would actually fill in that gap would be would be the best process. You know, to what, what we've been setting up with the local enterprise side of things is a club type feel. So if you're a member of that club, we will walk you through the step by step process to export. Uh, and then you get to the stage where we feel you're ready to export, that's when we pass you on to the relevant agencies, be it SDI or Scottish Enterprise. Um, and there definitely seems to be that requirement and, and that and that need. Uh, we've had good turnouts to our initial few workshops that we've had and really, really basic workshops, you know, sit around the table with 10 other members and, and, and work on your business strategy together, that type of real hand-holding. And I think that's where sort of like the mentoring programme that also runs from Scottish Chambers comes in. Businesses want to hear from other businesses, what, what does it mean to run a business, like really run to business, uh, run a business. We had an event uh, a couple of weeks ago on international, what it means to, to export to a certain country. We had a presentation from SDI, which was fantastic. I'm, I'm looking at it thinking that's amazing stuff that they've got there that businesses are not using. But then we got a business stand up and talk about what it means to export. It's a completely different story. But a really good story, you know, one of their biggest uh, contracts they won in China, it wasn't the selling to China or going to China, it was getting rid of the rubbish for something that they had to do. It was, it was little things that you wouldn't talk about in a normal sort of agency type scenario, you know. You need I'm, to heal from real business. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested by the fact that on several occasions you've, you've linked uh, questions about productivity and investment back to your work with developing the young workforce, you know, and interesting enough, again, our agencies are, on those areas are, are not linked. You know, we've yeah. got SDS on the one hand and, and, and Scottish Enterprise. I mean, do you think our skill strategy needs to be more closely aligned with our investment strategy? Are there things that we could do to ensure that SDS is working more in lockstep with, with Scotch Enterprise and, and, and kind of investment led? I do, but the reason I keep linking back to developing our workforce is that model. Yeah. It works. Um, and I really think it worked long time, and the model is that it's private sector led and it's locally led. Um, local areas, every area is different across Scotland and, and in our area, in our chamber, I know a lot of our businesses like I know my family. <laughs> so 
So, they, you know, they've come to me with things they maybe probably wouldn't go to other people about, and there's a local feel about it. So it's not so necessarily saying that skills directly, I think they do, need to link, but it's the model of that project that works. So, so just briefly, just by, by way of clarification, I mean, do you think, in both in terms of you know, Scottish enterprise and business support and indeed in terms of skill strategy, are, are you saying that you would like to see more private sector involvement and more private sector leadership in both of those areas? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thanks very much. Just to follow up on the productivity question, because uh, it's, it seems to be flavour not just of the month, but flavour of the year, and the UK industrial strategy announced yesterday productivity was, was one of the key uh, focus points. Uh, the adoption of new technology is one of the key areas the industrial strategy is focused around. And you mentioned millennial companies, almost by definition, new companies coming to the market now or being established will be looking at new technology and e-commerce. E um, just in terms of the support available for new companies looking, or existing companies, looking to adopt uh, e-commerce or, or new technology, what, what level of uh, advice and skills are available within the enterprise agencies uh, both you know, Scottish Enterprise, HIE uh, and Business Gateway when it comes to advising companies uh, to adopt technology and uh, move on towards e-commerce? E um, that personally is not an area that I'm, I'm really that knowledgeable in, I'd have to be totally honest about, but from the meetings that I go to and the meeting I was in down in London is that, that, that nobody's moving fast enough in that area, so that there is quite a big gap, uh, we're not taking that seriously enough as to how fast that is actually moving, and I would say that the, the, my general opinion is the support on that side of things is pretty far behind and, and too slow again, it's moving so fast. Uh, and just uh, going back to the more general question of support available from the enterprise agencies. Audit Scotland last year did uh, a report on the uh, enterprise agencies, some you know, positive feedback, but their overall conclusion was it's a cluttered landscape, which I thought I think you alluded to and so, some, some of the committee members have highlighted. Are there particular areas of the enterprise landscape that is working well in, in your view, and what areas might uh, need urgent attention if we are looking at um, improving the, the support available to, to businesses? Sorry, can you pin that down a little bit more, sorry, on the enterprise side of things? Sure, so I'm just wondering, you, in terms of identifying uh, the support available, in other countries, for example, you will have a, a, a digital portal that is available to businesses, uh, either large or small, when if they're looking for advice in exporting or investment or otherwise, uh, that advice is available through one single door, one door of entry, uh, whereas in Scotland it's a very cluttered landscape. Sometimes you just don't know where to begin that conversation or begin the analysis. Uh, what do you think would work, as, as a business person, what do you think would work in terms of uh, having that access and the, the, the advice easier for, for businesses to handle? You're all really going to laugh at me now, but <laughs> we in our area have, again, worked on a portal for the developing our workforce, which has been looked at to use nationally because it is so easy to use. Again, um, we really stuck to a, a, a portal that very much looked, again, like a private sector business type sort of scenario, and it's very, very easy to use, but it's like a one-stop shop. It gives the, the information everywhere that you need in a very, very simple way. We've broken it down into to education, business, young people and parents, and each, each area has its own information that they would need and require, and something like that would be an absolutely huge asset, I think, in, in anything, be it, you know technical export education it's it's been it's been a huge hit and and it gives a very very clear picture and tidies up the cluttered landscape which is there brings every partner to the table that's there uh, and there's huge interest in it nationally at the moment okay yeah. can i ask what, what what what's it called and how, how to is it available to the public or it is available to, to the member? public now we only launched it in september right. so it's our developing west lothian's developing young workforce portal right yeah but it has been looked at at a national level because we have taken time um, to do it and we were pushed and pulled and told there was this and that and I stood my ground and I said no, I was something specifically that I wanted it to look like this and work like this and we stood our ground and now that it's launched everybody's been quite surprised and okay. intrigued by it all but I think it's just developing your workforce, West Lothian, WL is the website. 
Yeah. And is that, without getting into technology, which you would lose me very quickly on, <laughs> but is that uh, interlinked into the other like enterprise uh, websites? Yeah. Is it So you have one door of entry and that's linked to like existing? It's linked to, yeah, right. it's linked to STS. It goes through to my world of work. It goes through to Marketplace. It goes through to the universities. It goes through to the local college. Uh, it goes through to the job centre. We can actually advertise jobs on it. So companies are posting mm. jobs. Uh, it advertises modern apprenticeship advertises foundation apprenticeships you name it anything to do with recruiting it is the young workforce but I think it would work for any workforce to be mm. fair and that's why I'd like to see it evolve over time is to for any age of workforce uh, it doesn't, you don't have to be under 24 for it to work for you but it links through to literally every agency that you would be required to use okay the fi final question if I may and it's I think it's the question I was meant to ask um, Going back to West Lothian, um, examples of regional selective assistance being used um, in your area uh, for job creation or new business creation, have there been good recent examples or other examples you can point to? Not in particular, no. Uh, main focus in our area has been definitely on developing our workforce recently and that seems to be what's the, that is the highlight at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Martha wanted to come in at that point. I'm curious, you've spoken a great deal about the developing young workforce plan. Um, I also noticed from your website the um, Employable Young People Erasmus Plus project that you have. Is, can you maybe tell the committee a bit more about it? Um, yes, uh, I applied for funding Erasmus Plus uh, and I've worked in partnership with um, uh, Spain, Turkey, Italy, Romania and Greece. Um, it's been a huge success and something that... Um, I'm going to look for funding to deliver as of next year. We had a week-long programme here where they brought young people from all over these countries to Scotland for a week, a fortnight ago. It was an absolutely outstanding success. I couldn't believe how these young people from all these different countries, and they're all from disadvantaged backgrounds, all bonded and got on with very simple uh, you know, confidence building work and, and schemes and, and, and educating them in a, in a non-educational way, if you like. Um, and I know they've got a group running already, and they're all they're all friends still on on a WhatsApp group from from all over these countries. So it's been an absolute massive, massive success. Um, the only disappointing that I would say on the back of that, that when these projects run, there's nothing supporting that. What I would like to see, I mean, we, I had five young people, Scottish people, involved in the project, and these were very, very far from the, the pipeline of any kind of positive destination, young people. And I would say it's changed them in a week. But what do I do with them now? You know, there's no funding to continue their development. Um, I struggle to get any agency to... I find these five young people myself because no agency would send me five people <laughs> in Scotland. <laughs> so I really struggle to get five young people um, because they won't do anything that's not funded or fits into their programme or... Um, so I'm disappointed that there's no at obvious funding at the moment which will continue the programme to run. But it was a huge asset. Just in terms of the, the future of the programme, um, it lends itself as an Erasmus project towards again, various concerns and considerations regarding Brexit. And more generally, is what are the views and opinions of your, your members as regards to the UK withdrawing from the European Union? Is it something that's brought up regularly or is it not something you tend to hear too much about? I would say it's not talked about enough. Um, I would say there's obviously concerns, and in our area, our biggest concern is the workforce. You know, majority of our workforce are EU nationals, um, because a lot of manufacturing in our area, so that is their biggest concern. Um, our biggest concern as a chamber, um, and, and our work with, with Ireland recently, has been that the, there's a little bit of burying their head in the sand kind of going on with businesses, the, the, and it's going to be honest very quickly. So we are looking at uh, running some workshops as of the new year on preparation for Brexit. You know, whether it's hard or soft, there are basic housekeeping rules that we we can uh, put in place that would uh, have a business ready for the worst case scenario. Um, a lot more. We need to be talking a lot more about what the possibilities are. I sit with a lot of different agencies, Food and Drink, Rotolers Association. They all have very different points of view and issues that's going to arise. That a lot of which, when you speak to them, you think, oh, "I never even thought about that." So. <laughs> It's very common, I found in conversations about Brexit, there's always areas that one hasn't considered and when yeah. one does, it's uh, eye-watering complexity and implications. Um, do you see any positives from the UK leaving the European Union? 
Um, I, I do. I think more, you know, uh, UK trade, you know, uh, particular products that we're buying, we're buying out with local. I mean, for example, butter. You know, you know, we buy most of our butter from from Ireland. You know, that might be that that's then purchased within this country. Um, so there are positives on that side of things. Um, but the, the biggest, the biggest worry is the international workforce. And, and balance, is it something you would say is a, a positive or a negative? In balance, that would be my personal opinion on <laughs> both. Both. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a politician's yeah. answer. <laughs> I do. I do personally see both. Yeah. I think long term, it could be a good thing. As a final question, because there hasn't, um, there is still some element of uncertainty regarding the future status of non-UK EU nationals. Is that something that you feel is impacting upon EU nationals within West Lothian in a sense that they're perhaps more minded to relocate to other parts of the European Union? There's a drop off in the number of EU nationals, certainly for example um, in health and social care, it's a significant, highly significant uh, reduction in number of um, non-UK EU nurses registering in the UK. Um, is that something you're experiencing in other sectors? Um. Again, both some companies are saying to us that they're leaving, they're moving to Ireland, um, and others are saying they've seen no difference at all. Um, so I think hope most are hanging on hoping it's not going to be an issue long term. But do you think there's another element, as you said, with businesses of head in the sand? I would say yes, yep, at okay. the moment. There's a lot more awareness in Ireland of it. They're a lot more concerned and doing a lot more about it to prepare and think about it. Uh, may I ask a question just about the Scottish Investment Bank? Are you aware of any of the businesses in West Lothian applying for money from the Scottish Investment Bank? Uh, I'm not, but I have been promoting it on a regular basis because I went myself to, to meet with them to see what the process was. And I thought <coughs> the process was very good. And as I said, said some sort of setup like that would be more of more use, I would say, than the initial business gateway sort of set up. Because when I went to meet the agent there, they were much more hands-on to help you prepare mm. your, your business plan and what you actually needed to do and work with you on that plan. And I have promoted it many times to our members. The take-up, I would say, is probably pretty slow, though. Still mm. um, weary. I, and do you have any idea why the take-up is so slow, if the process, as you see it, is better or helpful? I think history. Of, of working with these agencies in the past, as you said, being time consuming and cumbersome. And, um, it, it's, it's, it's fear of the past of what it's like working with these agencies, which can be a long, slow, costly process. I think Andy Whiteman wanted process. to come in with a follow up on that. Yes, I just noted that the Scottish Investment Bank's introduced this peer to peer lending platform, Lending Crowd. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you described earlier about the kind of cumbersome process of having to prepare business plans and all the rest of it, which is rather out of date. Obviously, peer-to-peer -peer lending is, whoa, right up there. Yeah. Um, and uh, the risks are very much more those risks that are identified by the peers rather than by some, some third party. Yeah. I mean, do you see potential in that? Is that something you've had any engagement with? I haven't had a lot of engagement, but I, I, again, I thought that as a big asset. I think, I think something like that is a big improvement. I, as I said, I only had an hour meeting with... Um, the gentleman, but I was quite impressed when I went to see him that the different avenues of, of lending were, were very vague and what they said that once they, they looked at what you were doing and what you were looking for, that they would then partner you in the right direction, which I really liked. Um, but there needs to be more awareness to businesses and it's just going to take time, but they need to, probably businesses need to be shown what is, what is actually available and out there. More old fashioned business branding and marketing would be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So a bit of the new and a bit of the old then. Um, moving on then to John Mason. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, as, you, as you probably gathered, we're looking both at uh, kind of wider economic performance and we're also looking at this year's budget and so on. So starting probably with the latter, the economic performance side, um, and looking at the area of kind of fair work and, and all that's included in there, living wages, workforce uh, balance, workforce engagement, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, would you say for, for your companies and for the chambers, uh, these are important issues or really our business is more focused just on, well, it's the, it's the bottom line, it's making a profit, these things are less important. How, how do you feel that all works? I would say they're very for the you know the fair work side of things, but some of the feedback that I got from companies was that you know the fair work is important to them, but there also has to be um, 
more awareness that there needs to be more support in for companies and not always taking from companies. There needs to be support in job and wealth creation so they can then offer the fair work environment. But if the pressure is always on them with increased taxes and increased hoops to jump through, it doesn't make their life. It's just another add-on uh, to what is already a difficult landscape for them. Right. Um, so it's is it... Is there something specific we could do to help them with the fair work agenda? I mean, there's things like the um, Scottish Business Pledge and so on, or is that just seen as another hoop, as another kind of... Probably seen another hoop. I have to say I haven't heard a lot of companies mention that since it was launched, so... Um, yeah, at the start... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it is just it's more of the long game. You know, the, the companies want to do good by their, by their employees, but if it's made difficult for them, as I said at the other end, that there's always continuous added legislation for them to have to deal with, then it does slip down the rank of importance of running their business. Um, and that's, that's basically the feedback that I've been getting from them. OK. I and mean, if we take groups that have traditionally maybe been disadvantaged or at least not seen so much, I mean, are you seeing more women coming through running businesses, more ethnic minority people running businesses, more disabled people running businesses? Yes. A, is, is there a feel for that at all? There's definitely a feel for that. Um, um, I've spoken to several companies that are setting up particular sort of uh, women back to work programmes. There's more companies letting people work from home. Uh, you know, in the day age of IT, there's uh, no reason a lot of people can't actually work in their own in their own home. You know, with Skype and all the technology that's there. So more companies are looking at that sort of type of setup and flexible working time and. It's definitely a change in, in that environment so that they can they can work more closely uh, with those types of people. I mean, we've had, I think, some evidence that, you know, bigger companies, they've got policies and they've just got a bit more kind of uh, ability to move things around. Smaller businesses can find it quite hard to maybe take on a disabled employee or, um, you know, uh, and, and other things like that. Do you think there is a difference between bigger and smaller companies or...? There, there would be and there wouldn't be. I mean, obviously, it's, it's easier for a larger company to take, uh, but I wouldn't say there was a big divide. I would say the smaller companies are trying just as hard and probably more likely to be offering the work-from-home environment uh, and these types of different ways of running a company. Smaller companies have to adapt and, and change to, f to fit into the environment. And the environment these days is that um, skills are very hard to find, so you need to tap into every, every market. Um, to look into. There's certainly a lot more awareness raising of all these different different areas um, coming to the table than I've seen before. So companies are a lot more aware of the workforce that's out there available to them. And then moving specifically back to the kind of budget and Scottish Enterprise, which we're looking at, I mean, is it your feeling, and I don't know if you, you maybe pick that up or maybe you don't, that for these issues are important issues for Scottish Enterprise? I mean, are they encouraging companies, do you think, to uh, have a more balanced workforce make sure they pay a living wage, these kind of things? I'd have to say I wouldn't know. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks That's very much. something I'm aware of. Right, I think Andy Whiteman had questions he wanted to come back to on a slightly different subject. Um, did I? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I've covered uh, what I wanted to come back to. I, I thought you'd you said you did, but it maybe you, you'd... Um, <laughs> you, everything was covered by others in that case. Um, did Daniel Johnson have something further you wanted oh, to ask? Does a nice shade of Andy then? So, <laughs> well, please. <laughs> right. Are there are there any other committee members wish to ask anything further at this stage? Um, uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, sorry, Jamie Hulk or Johnson. I don't think you've had an opportunity yet. I haven't. Um, thank you very much, and apologies for, for for coming late. I think you've hit every uh, bit of roadworks so I could on the way down from Aberdeen. Apologies for for not being here from the start. I just wanted to ask, one of the things that um, we discussed when uh, we were on the way day uh, in, in Livingston was you talked about, and apologies if it's been covered as well, um, the importance of kind of uh, engagement with businesses and with schools and colleges and, and the like. Um, I wondered how, whether, we, whether there's enough of that going on and how we can kind of encourage that. I think part of the, one of the issues raised was actually almost teachers need to come into businesses to get a better idea in terms of career, uh, career guidance. Uh, and how important that was at kind of, I suppose, bringing through the right skills into a business and business finding the right skills out, out with, um, out with their company. 
Um, yes, as, as I've mentioned, everybody several times today, um, developing a workforce has been has been pushing that forward, and it has been a huge success. And we have started in our area um, the work experience where we take the teachers and the college lecturers out into business for work experience, not just the young people. So there's been a couple of programmes run already, but that's going to be sort of the norm in our area and run on a regular basis. So I think the last day out they had, they had 40 teachers. So there was a, there was a big take up on it all. So there was obviously nobody in school, but um, it, it's been a big success so far that we've piloted it, yeah. And there haven't been reservations from either the te teachers or from the companies you've been able to find? Um, at the start, teachers probably were concerned about time. They have a lot on their plate to deal with as it is, but I think now they're seeing that the assets behind it, uh, you know, having outweigh the time, if you like. Um, business, we've never struggled with engagement from business on this topic at all. And I would say it's only growing and improving on a daily basis. And do you know, I know it's not your area, but do you know of other um, chambers that do it, say, up in the Highlands and Islands area? Um, there are several other chambers that run the developing young workforce in that area, and they all have a sort of similar sort of stream going on within them. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. And Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. We've discussed a lot about the enterprise advice available, and we touched a bit about capital and funding available. You mentioned the Scottish Investment Bank, and uh, I've heard a lot of good um, feedback about the co-investment programme, bringing together some public sector funding, but more importantly, private sector funding uh, and expertise. Could, do you have good examples of uh, that co-investment funding with, with your members or otherwise? Uh, as, as I said earlier, um, no, but I think there's, it's a huge asset and, and um, something that we need to be pushing forward more so our companies are more aware of its actual existence in the first place. Yeah, um, I would like to see that more on offer straight in, as I said, business gateway level um, and more promotion. I would think most businesses don't even know it's there. Okay. Yeah. And again, uh, another availability of capital. Uh, last year, the Scottish Growth Scheme was announced as a potentially £500 million uh, contribution to the Scottish economy. Ha have any of your members or any other businesses you've dealt with, have they been able to access or have assistance under the Growth Scheme? Not aware of it, no. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are no further questions from committee members, um, thank you very much for coming in today. And um, I hope you found that a useful session as we have. Thank you, thank you very much. OK, I'll suspend the um, session and wait for the gallery to clear. Thank you very much.